Um, well, it's a great pleasure. Welcome, everyone. I mean, it's a great pleasure being back at Schumacher and being back in this area, which is like so alive with uh, change and with the, um, the search for a saner, a saner way of living, I feel. Um, what, what I will talk about tonight is basically something which is very familiar to you. That is uh, how our modern mind has lost touch of some fundamental um, qualities and how it has lot, lost touch with the soul of the world. Um, so I will kind of retrace a little bit that journey. Uh, how, how did we come to see the world the way we see it today? Uh, how, how the, um, let's say, dominant scientific culture of today came to see the world the way it sees it? Um, and then I will point out how within the scientific enterprise itself, there's the seed of a movement which goes in the opposite direction, which goes towards like recovering a sense of, of uh, the non-separability of the world, the non-separability of consciousness and world, of mind and, and matter. Um, I apologize with my students of the course, because uh, you will uh, hear once again <laughs> the stuff that we've been uh, working on these days. Um, but it will be a bit shorter. <laughs> um, so, I'd like to, to start with this picture. It's a picture that um, uh, Richard Tarnas as, as shown during a talk he gave at Eranos. Eranos is an east-west center founded by a Dutch woman and by N.C.G. Jung in the 30s, where I've uh, worked for 10 years. Um, and I don't know how many of you know Richard. This is an amazing person, uh, a great astrologer and, and great um, scholar of uh, cultures. Well, anyway, it, this, this picture is kind of a symbolic representation of the worldview of primitive and traditional people. The, the big circle is supposed to represent the cosmos and, and the small circle the human being. And the blue color is consciousness or mind. I will use the word consciousness and mind quite loosely in this talk, and often... If you didn't speak any louder, it would be really helpful. All right. Uh, sorry. Thank you. My voice is not, not so powerful. Please remind me if I drop down again. Can you hear me? Yeah, much better. All right. <laughs> um, big circle is cosmos. Small circle is human being. Um, and blue color is consciousness or mind. And the small circle is with, dot, with a dotted line, which wants to suggest that in this cosmology, the, the individual human being is kind of permeable. It's not separate from her or his environment. It's, it's like immersed in a, a live cosmos in which like every action of daily life is entering into relationship with beings. The, the cosmos is populated with innumerable beings. Um, in India still when you walk when you walk around the country you will see some at the at the base of a tree some little clay statue, a flower, a small something, which is like an homage to the tree. Um, the, the hunters in, in traditional society talk to their prey. 
It's not simply killing it and using it, but it's being part of a cycle of life in which uh, the life that I, I now absorb to nourish myself and my family is the same that we will eventually return to the big cycle of life. How did, you, uh, how did we lose this? Where did we go? What, what's been our journey from there? Um, there's, I, I will go th- very quickly through some um, main, main steps in the process of getting from that space to our modern view of the world. Uh, one, one major turning point happened around 8,000 BC when we started farming. When we started farming, that changed many things. It, uh, for the first time in, in our history as a species, we were able to put aside a surplus of food. Um, that allowed many new developments. It, it allowed basically specialization of work. It was not, we were not like constantly involved in survival, but could devote to various um, activities, various more specialized activities, uh, and that was the beginning of cities, the beginning of uh, kingdoms and empires, was the beginning of various forms of technology and was the beginning of religion. Or or at least, let me me phrase it differently, of religion as a special activity with a a cast of priests um, managing it in the in the primitive cosmos, in a way, religion is everyone's affair to the same degree. Everyone is in touch with the mystery of life we're immersed in. Um, in, in the Neolithic society, this, the, the, the origin of agriculture uh, corresponds roughly with the change from the, the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. Um, in the Neolithic society, a, a, case, a, a, a caste of <coughs> priests appears together with the uh, kings and uh, servants. Well, another, another major turning point uh, happens about two, three thousand years ago, in, originally in the Middle East, with uh, with the advent of monotheistic religions, first Judaism, which then generates Christianity and Islam, and it's like covers a large part of the world nowadays. Um, there's quite a different cosmos in the in in the monotheistic religions. Uh, consciousness or mind is no longer spread out over the whole world. It's basically the its, its epitome is the mind of God, which is above uh, and, and separate from the world, and and the mind of human beings. The in a way, the adventure of human beings becomes its relationship with God, not so much its relationship with the world. In, in the tradition of monotheistic religions, the world has been created for human beings to use. Um, that's a very different relationship with the world. In this in this relationship, the world is no longer animated, doesn't have an anima, a soul. Um, 
the anima becomes like an attribute of human beings that relates it to God. The boundaries between being and world are no longer permeable. Um, that's a picture of the modern world. There's, um, consciousness has basically disappeared. <laughs> it might be it might be concentrated in this little dot here, but maybe not because let's say according to some of contemporary neuroscience, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of actually material processes in the brain. So in the modern world, consciousness has a very flimsy status. Um, well, you might notice that the dot is no longer at the center. And that's a, another major transi transition which uh, happened with Copernicus the realization that uh, we're not necessarily the center of the whole thing. Um, it's, interesting, it's interesting how this development took place. Um, people had been, had been noticing the motion of, of the planets for a long time. When you look at the sky, there's the sun, the moon, and a few luminaries in the sky that have a very distinctive motion, while all the rest of the night sky rotates uniformly around us. And the motion of the sun and the moon are, are extremely relevant, of course, for our life. Uh, so people also <laughs> saw the motion of these other anomalous luminaries, which we now call planets, as, as very significant for human life. And, for example, the whole notion of, of astrology is founded in the observation of those motions. Uh, and around the second century AD, um, Ptolemaeus developed a theory of the motion of the planets. A very fine and sophisticated theory that worked well and was, um, was taught for about 15, almost 1,500 years. Um, it, was, it was based on cycles upon cycles, epicycles. And it, was, it gave like a, a very reasonable, very accurate prediction of the position of the planets. Until, until around 14, 1400, when a big change of perspective happened with Copernicus. Uh, that change of perspective did not happen because of astronomical observations. It was driven by a different uh, criterion, a criterion which is, became very important in science. And that's a criterion of simplicity. Copernicus suddenly realized that the whole complex pattern of Ptolemaeus epicycles would be resolved into something much simpler. And if instead of looking from the Earth's point of view, we looked from the Sun's point of view. Then suddenly, all the planets had like a, a regular elliptic orbit around the sun. It was, it was a big change in, in at least two major ways. In one way, it displaced us from the center. And that was only the beginning of the displacement because the system uh, Copernicus system still had the sun at the center, but then we had to gradually discover uh, that our position kind of went more and more <laughs> off-centered uh, in that 
even the sun has no special place. It's just one star we know now um, amongst many which compose our galaxy, which is the Milky Way that we see at night. Um, kind of an average star, not too big, not too small, like um, billions of other. Um, the galaxy is supposed to contain uh, around 170 billion stars. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, it contains more than that. Um, the galaxy is one of 170 billion galaxies that we see in the sky. And each galaxy contains a variable number from uh, hundreds of million to trillion stars. So it's, and, and, and still, like most of the space is empty. <coughs> so we are in a big place. <laughs> I mean, kind of like a random little spot of this big place. Well, another, another big change we could describe uh, uh, with Descartes, who is kind of, he formalized a notion which had a deep impact on, on the further development of, of Western thought. The idea that mind and matter are two different substances. Um, he, he, his, his plan was to give philosophy a sound foundation. And he found that, so it was like um, getting ready to get rid of anything that could be doubt, could be doubted and finding like a um, bedrock foundation for the philosophical enterprise. He found that everything can be doubted except the fact that I am thinking. He was thinking, no doubt. <laughs> One could say um, that I'm feeling, but um, his, his focus was on I'm thinking. Uh, so that was the primary evidence. Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Uh, but if, if the primary experience is completely in the mind, it's thinking, what about the world? So he was, he was brought to <coughs> consider, uh, to, to look at reality in a dualistic way, in which there's on one, on one hand there's um, res cogitans, mind, and on the other there's res extensa, matter. Can you, can you still hear me? Not very well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, do, we don't have a microphone. Or, no? Okay, well, I'll keep, keep, keep protesting. <laughs> All right. I'll do my best. It might help if you stood on that side yeah. of the screen because right. she's further away. Yes. Is that Thank you. <laughs> Great. See, here, here's Copernicus in action. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's kind of a paradoxical. Uh, consequence of, of Descartes' philosophy in that he starts from mind as primary <coughs> evidence and then decides that the world consists of these two things, two different things. Res cogitans, which has no place in space, uh, and, and res extensa matter, which is located in space. Descartes was the inventor of the mathem that mathematic tool, which are the Cartesian axes. Like the basic structure of a graph is made of two of a vertical and horizontal axis. Uh, he introduced that. So he was certainly very much attuned to the notion of the world uh, as having a spatial dimension and things existing in space. The paradoxical consequence of, of Descartes' work uh, 
is that while he started from mind as primary evidence, uh, the separation of these two substances um, allowed scientists to focus on, on just one of them, on res extensa, in a very focused way, in order to discover the intrinsic laws of matter. So, the, from the cut on, the scientific enterprise went deeper and deeper into the study of matter. Um, <coughs> no, I'm going to skip this. Um, I'll come to this soon. Um, so if that, if that is a first paradox, what I want to um, lead you on, on a walk tonight <laughs> uh, is through another paradox, which is um, what happened with, with quantum physics. Uh, how, as we went deeper into the study of matter, uh, we found strange things. We found, in a sense, let me say it first in a brutal way, <laughs> as we went deep into the heart of matter, we found that uh, matter does not exist. Or to say it more cautiously, matter is something quite different from the notion of solid objects having defined properties which corresponds to our, our everyday notion of matter. Um, how, how, did, how did that notion, that solid notion of matter, got in, in, into crisis? Uh, well, by, by experiments showing us things that we could not interpret in, in the old frame of uh, in the old notion of man. And here's, here's a classic one. It's, it's a, a typical experiment. This is a simplified form of um, a diffraction experiment, which in reality is done with like a thin <laughs> layer of some material and shining light through it and observing the patterns that are formed on the other side. And here we have simplified it into just one screen with two slits. And there's a particle, an electron, say, uh, coming from the left, crossing the screen, and, and hitting a photographic plate. And our question is, like, how the hits on the photographic plate will be distributed? <laughs> How the, how the hits on the photographic plate are distributed. Okay. Each, each electron, when, when it hits the plate, leaves a dot. So we are looking actually at the density of dots, or at the blackening of, of the photographic plate. Uh, suppose that at first we keep only one of those slits open. Let's say A is open. The blackening on, on, the, on the photographic plate will be something like this. This kind of bell curve, which is concentrated in front of the A slit and fades away on the two sides. If we, if we hold only slit B open, it's another bell curve centered on, on slit B. Now we would expect if um, I, I, the either or logic <coughs> works, if, if the electron can pass through slit A or slit B, that we should get the sum of these two curves. Those that pass through A distribute themselves this way, those that pass through B distribute themselves this way. No, that's not what we see. 
what we see is this wavy pattern here, quite different from the sum of these two. This we can read in two ways. In one way, it's like the nature of this object, of this electron, is from one point of view a particle, from another point of view a wave. A particle, because when it hits the screen, it leaves a well-defined dot. But when we look at the statistics of the dot, that behaves like a wave. When two waves meet, you get a figure like this. So it behaves as if there's one wave coming out of slit A and one wave coming out of slit B, and they meet on the photographic plate and create that pattern. So the difference between the wavy pattern and the sum of these two is telling us that in some ways the electron is passing through both slits at once. It's, um, these results are incompatible with an either-or logic in which the electron either passes through A or passes through B. How, how did the physicist um, picture this type of situation? They pictured, they pictured it through uh, the idea of a, of a wave function, which is like a little cloud. The electron is potentially in any place within, imagine here, a little cloud, which could be more dense in some places and less in others. And the electron can be anywhere in that cloud. That cloud is a cloud of probability. Let's say of, of it's like where potentially the electron is. And it, it travels this little cloud. It passes through those two slits. It interacts with itself on the other side and forms that pattern on the screen. Um, that's, that's a way of conceiving uh, matter uh, which deprives it of an objective status. It's, um, this had been described from one point of view, it's like Nature shows us different faces depending on how we interrogate her, it, uh, with our experiments. And it can show a, a wave face or a particle face depending on how we interact with it. Or another, another equivalent point of view is like there is an in intrinsic indeterminacy in, 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 in the nature of things, in which, let's say, I said we describe the electron as a little cloud. That means I, the electron cannot be completely localized. There is a complementarity between various property of any microscopic system in which as you focus more intensely for example on the position of an electron you completely lose track of its velocity <coughs> if you focus on the velocity you lose track of the position it's kind of a rubber ball that if you compress it on one side you lose it on the other uh, and uh, there, is, there is no state of a, of, a, of a microsystem that describes it completely. You, could, you can define some properties up to a point, but there will always be a complementary side where you're losing. 
you, you increase information in one direction, you lose it in the other. So there's kind of, a, and because of that, it will always be unpredictable whether the electron goes through slit A or slit B. And likewise, um, there's always an unpredictability when I make an experiment on a microscopic uh, system. This is a notion that um, this notion of, of, of the cloud, which we can also call a superposition of states, because it's like the, the electron is simultaneously in all these various states. Um, it has kind of a multiple identity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this, this notion um, deeply disturbed uh, even some of the founders of the theory. It's, it's um, very unsettling, let's say, from a, a solid materialistic point of view. And one of the, one of the people who was deeply disturbed by this is Albert Einstein who had given a fundamental contribution to the theory itself, but didn't quite like the, the, the implications of it. Um, one of his famous sentences is, God doesn't play dice. This randomness cannot be God's work. Um, he, was, he was hoping that at some point we would discover a, a further theory, even deeper than quantum. Quantum physics is, in a way, a deeper level than the classical physics. But he was hoping we would discover an even deeper level where things would go back to being solid and concrete and, and having def well-defined properties. Um, so he was convinced that quantum physics is... is lacking, is um, missing some essential ingredient, and kept discussing this with Niels Bohr, who was one of the main, uh, was maybe the main reference figure for the interpretation of these phenomena. Um, uh, he, would, he would keep in proposing, inventing thought experiments for Bohr, and, and discuss them with Bohr, experiments that would show, in, in Einstein's mind, the, the lack of the incompleteness of quantum physics. Bohr was very clever and was always giving like, good answers to, to Einstein's challenges. Uh, but Einstein's masterpiece is an, a thought experiment he devised in uh, 1935, which is, is known as EPR, which are the initials of the three authors of the paper where the, the experiment came out, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Um, and the experiment uh, put, uh, put in evidence a, a property that we now <coughs> consider absolutely fundamental, a phenomenon that we consider fundamental, which is entanglement. And entanglement is, is a relationship between two systems that have interacted uh, and remain, in a sense, always one system. Things that have interacted are forever one. Uh, in, in, in Einstein's uh, thought experiment, there were like, an, let's say, an atom parting into two parts. Uh, the properties of the two parts are, are, are related. For example, here are re represented by these two arrows going in opposite directions. 
then they move apart. And there we have two observers, Alice and Bob, far away from each other, each one with an instrument to measure this little arrow. I'm not going to go into the details of what's the little arrow and how the thing works, because that's not essential for our argument. The essential point is that quantum physics predicts that the statistics, let's say you do this experiment many times, we, we did it this morning with someone standing and some of us being the particle going <laughs> traveling <laughs> to the two. To, to. Uh, you do this experiment many times, the statistics uh, that Bob sees uh, on, on this side depends on what type of observation Alice has chosen to do. So she can, this is, the apparatus is represented as a magnet, she can run with north and south poles, she can rotate her magnet the way she wants, and the statistics of results of Bob will depend on how she's arranged her apparatus. Vice versa. Depending which one of the two particles reaches first. Uh, then the way Bob has arranged this apparatus will influence Alice's statistics. Um, strange notion that left Bohr quite uh, confused, but then the experiment was forgotten for about 30 years, and then uh, John Bell, uh, another physicist, proved a, a, a very clever little theorem. He analyzed this experiment, not in the physical details, but in the logical structure, and compared the quantum description of it with um, a general logical description based on the idea of realism and locality. What, the, what those two words mean? By realism, Bell meant that properties belong to the actual system. Let's say that this arrow is, is correspond to something in the particle itself. It's not something that magically appears when we observe it, but it's, it's a real quality of the particle. It's like um, that my sweater is blue means that there is some intrinsic thing in the fabric making it, which corresponds to the fact that the light bouncing off it is blue. <laughs> uh, and locality means that uh, things do not influence uh, each other instantly at a distance. That all influences are transmitted by some kind of signal. Maybe a light ray, maybe a telephone call, or <laughs> whatever. But for something happening at Alice to influence what's going on with Bob, there must be something traveling from Alice to Bob. That concept is called locality. But here there seems to be like a non-local, a non-local effect taking place. And there is, in fact. Um, because um, Bell, Bell saw that the prediction on the statistics of this experiment coming from realism and locality are different than the predictions from quantum theory. So that made the experiment very interesting and kind of unique in a way because it was like a physical experiment answering a very philosophical question. Is the world realist and local or not? Quantum physics says not, but 
if Einstein were right, quantum physics is not the ultimate answer and there should be like a further underlying theory which is realistic and local. Um, <coughs> at, at the time of Einstein and even at the time of John Bell, uh, there was no way of separating Alice and Bob enough and moving this uh, instrument, this apparatus, fast enough to exclude any possible signal traveling. But then people got to work on that, and by 1980, they were ready to perform this experiment on a sufficiently large distance and with a fast enough movement of, <coughs> of the apparatus that there would be like no time for a signal to travel from Alice to Bob. Well, the answer was <coughs> perfectly agreeing with quantum physics and not agreeing with realism and locality. So, in a way, it's, like, it's been like more than 30 years that we've known that the world is not realistic and local. It's, it's something so fundamental and so um, shocking in a pleasant way, I would say, <laughs> that um, I'm always surprised that this is not a better known fact. Um, so the world, the world is, is in, in, in simple words, that the world is not realistic and local uh, could be formulated as the world is not made of objects. It's not made of things. What our notion of thing is something realistic and local. <coughs> I'm not going to go into that. Um, well, then, of course, the next question coming up is um, why does it appear to us as made of things, as made of objects? And that, the, the, that brings us to a big challenge, which is understanding what happens in a process of, in a quantum process of observation. Um, that's a, a peculiar, a peculiar thing of quantum physics is that it it works really well, and it it predicts things and describes things in extreme accurate detail. But the conceptual understanding at the core of the theory is still puzzling people. Uh, Hundred years after the beginning of of the theory. Um, or maybe I will say a few words about this. <laughs> um, this. This picture represents another thought experiment, which was pro proposed just as a provocation by um, Erwin Schrödinger, who's another one of the creator of quantum theory. Uh, and it's it's just a quick aside in a, in a long paper he wrote about quantum theory, but it, it impressed people very much, and it's like it's become standard lore of quantum physics. Uh, it, what what this means to what this means to to put in evidence is the fact that that little cloud that we've talked about. Uh, that describes quantum reality, that superposition of different um, s different states, of different positions or of different values of any uh, qua quantity of the system, that superposition is, <coughs> so to speak, contagious. When when we do an experiment. Um, 
let's say let's say inside this little box here there is the two slits experiment that we've described before so there will be like an electron for example that can pass through slit A or B there's two possible outcomes here and from the point of view of the quantum physics there's a little cloud covering them there's like a superposition of those two possibilities. Well, a straightforward quantum description of everything that's contained in the box would, uh, um, would lead me to the following. So, well, this, in the box there's, there's this like devilish uh, apparatus in which depending on the result of the observation that happens inside this little box, for example, which, which slit the electron goes through. Uh, it operates or does not operate a hammer that breaks or does not break a flask containing poison, which will spread or not spread through the box. And in one case, the cat will die. And in another case, the cat will live. So if, if we take a straightforward quantum description of all this, <coughs> inside here we have a superposition of A and B. Here we have a superposition of hammer up and hammer down. Here we have a superposition of flask whole or broken. And here we have a superposition of cat alive and dead but no one has ever seen a superposition of a cat alive and dead. <laughs> um, so it, it's a provocative thing. It's like if we take quantum physics literally, that's what should happen. Well, that's almost true. Um, what, what we now know is that it is, this is in principle correct, but the crucial element is that whether there will be somewhere a recording or a trace of what's happening in here. This would be correct if none of this would be like a, a, a trace of a consequence, a visible consequence of what has happened in here. As soon as there is a, um, a recording, a memory of the result of this experiment in here, then um, the superposition becomes equivalent to an either-or situation. So there will be no way of distinguishing the superposition of cat alive and dead from a cat, a cat either alive or dead. But notice that even so, um, if we would actually do this experiment, we would not find this ghostly thing that's a superposition of cat alive and dead, but it would be totally unpredictable which one we find. So the first interpretation of all this was um, maybe it's the observer consciousness that causes this situation to collapse into one or the other. And, and Schrodinger had proposed it with a cat, um, not considering the cat as an observer, <laughs> but uh, proposing the fact that then would be only when a human observer opens the box that this cloudy thing precipitates into one or the other. But that's a strange notion. It's, of course, uh, it, it's a weird notion that what happens if I open the box and I don't look? 
uh, or as I, as I said this morning, it's what happens if I take a Polaroid picture and don't look at it, and look at it one month later. Um, we could imagine then arbitrary <laughs> complications of it. Um, well, actually, we don't need to go there because it can be proved that if there is a, a concrete trace, and here there's a lot um, from all this, then this superposition is equivalent to an either-or situation. Doesn't doesn't tell me which one. It only tells that. So it's like the world appears to us solid, appears to us realistic and local, appears to us a world in which cats are either alive or dead, and no cloudy superposition, because in all our contact with the world, in all our experiencing the world, there is a trace form. There's actually innumerable traces form. But uh, I think from, from a basic, from a philosophical point of view, uh, the crucial thing is that we experience the world from inside the world. So all our experiences of the world corresponds to something happening in a body, our body. There is no experience except in interaction and involving uh, the body. So this is the reason why the world appears to us the way it appears. Um, it's like in its, in its subtle essence, so to speak, the, the word before experience, we, we are forced to describe it this way, as superposition of states. But the experience world it's necessarily because we are observers in, immersed in the world and because all of our, our experience of the world leaves a trace. At the very least, there will be like some pattern of firing in our brain. There will be hundreds of traces, millions of traces, but something will happen in a, in a body when someone experiences something. Even if I'm alone and meditating, there will be some process happening within my body that corresponds to experiences I have. Um, but that's, that's quite interesting because um, experiencing, we could see as like the, the root of Subjectivity. Our subjectivity is the collection of all our experiences. But this thing, which is the root of subjectivity, is also, as we saw, what makes the world appear concrete and material. The world is not like that in an ultimate sense, but we can only experience it like that. So the, 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 the local realistic world, the solid world, emerges in the process of experiencing. The process of experiencing is the root of both subject and object. That's a notion um, we find in some ancient philosophies, some, some Buddhist philosophical school, for example. It's like in our modern uh, thinking, 
we we tend, let's say, uh, the standard the standard modern cosmology assumes the primacy of matter of the material world. So how we imagine our story is like there's the Big Bang, there is then um, stars and galaxies are formed. Inside stars, uh, heavier element. Well, initially there's just hydrogen and helium. Then inside the stars, high, um, heavier elements are formed. These heavier elements combine um, to create life. Life evolves, and when you get, it gets to a sufficiently uh, sophisticated nervous system, then we have consciousness. What, what the, the perspective I'm, I'm suggesting here is like there is no matter without consciousness. And there is no consciousness without matter. These two that Descartes has separated um, are actually two, two sides of one coin. The world is mind-matter at all levels. Um, it's kind of a, a strange notion that there should be consciousness arising at one specific level of complexity and no consciousness below that. I think it's much more natural to imagine that consciousness is everywhere and it has just different degrees of complexity. No doubt the consciousness of a human being is different from the consciousness of a snake, which is different from the consciousness of a tree and so on. Um, but there is no matter without consciousness. Let's say that's the point of view that kind of... So, in some ways, um, if we take that... I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Here. Okay. Here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, I, what I'm suggesting that in some sense we're, we're getting closer to this old cosmology than to the, the, the split ones of Descartes and the soulless cosmos of, of modern um, science. It's pointing in this direction. We don't yet fully understand what's implied. Uh, we might never <laughs> understand it. Uh, reality is very rich and complex. So this is just a, a map. But the map is interesting because it points in some ways to a circular journey. Going back will not mean going back to, to the Paleolithic culture. That's unlikely, unless very bad things happen. <laughs> Hope not. Uh, Remember to speak out. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I would say, like, um, there's kind of a, a circular journey here. Coming back to a way of looking at reality, which, was, which is very ancient. And I'm saying it won't mean going back to Paleolithic culture, uh, but uh, it will be returning to that place with a different mind, with a different experience, with a different consciousness. 
It's like knowing, in a way, we need, in, in the myth of the Garden of Eden, we need to lose it, to refine it on another level. Um, maybe I will stop here for a moment. And yes, and just give give space to your questions, comments, or anything else. Thank you. Thank you.